as welcome to issues at hand peter kimazo your host we're talking education uh, i'll start from the extreme end mr tony mukasalu sambu the two things do you think they are related you have salima here saying do not reduce the per capita funding of universal primary education by a penny and by the end of the week you have a report that says education in uganda is not at the desirable level at all to say the least it's pathetic do you think those two are related in any way yes we are yet to find out the relationship but in brief i must say it's not a very very good movement it's not a good gesture that will reduce the funding to the UPE capitation grant actually i heard you earlier on in the presentation saying that uh, a member of parliament was saying it should stay but at worst but yeah, at worst but as primary education we had already requested for an increase and they were saying at least 10,000 per child per year. But currently, we are at 7,000 per child per year. And then it is the one that is rumored to be reduced. I call it re rumored because it has not yet come officially to our department. I thought, and I need to be corrected, Mr. Mukasa, mm. that the budget framework starts from the user departments. Am I right? Yes. And therefore, you feed into the process. Yes. You look at the MTEF, the medium term expenditure framework that projects how much money we shall spend over five years. Correct. And then you feed into that framework. And it is that that is presented in the budget estimates that subsequently become the finance bill, which is the budget. And okay. therefore, what we see right now should be your input. No. You see, Ministry of Education and Sports is a big, a big institution. So as departments, we make budgets, and the budgets are submitted to the planning department. And then the planning department goes ahead. But in our budget framework, as basic education department, mm. I do not remember at any moment at all saying, let us reduce the UP capitation grant. I don't remember at all doing such a thing, and I don't think we would afford to do that. What was your projected uh, interested minimum? 10,000 per child per year, at least. On the minimum? On the minimum. All right. Uh, it, is our, it was our request. Okay. Just at that level, Mr. Mukasa, and uh, this gets a, a little interesting now, the ministry would have 10,000 on the minimum to move from there onwards sure what you're provided for in the mtf is less than that correct what you're provided for in the current working estimates that are in front of parliament is even less than what is projected in the mtf yeah by about 230 270 shillings something like uh, that yes do you think in any way that the funding in UPE is related to the quality that comes out and therefore the Weso report would be right? Well, I could say yes and no. Let me hear the yes first. The yes first is to say funding, whether you like it or not, has an effect on the learning outcomes. Mm. But learning outcomes in totality are controlled by quite a number of factors, not only funding. That's why I, I, I go in for the yes and no. Let me hear the no now. The no is that there are quite a number of other factors that may control learning outcomes. Among which? Among which is community participation. Mm -hmm. I agree. Among which is the is the uh, attitude, attitude among the parents, attitude among the teachers, 
attitude among other stakeholders who control education in this country. Then you have facilities, other facilities, other inputs. A child wakes up to go to school. There are quite a number of essentials that this child has to go with, without which definitely the learning outcomes will be affected. Actually, now that you talk about, have we gone to the UESO report? Yes, but both of them are yes, related. Both ultimately. of them are related. I would love to see an, an extra effort about the UESO report to tell us exactly what you are asking for right now. What is the relationship between the input and the learning outcomes that the UESO report puts before us? What about the inputs? Do we, for example, let's take Kenya. Mm -hmm. what, what have they put in to have these learning outcomes? What has Tanzania put in to have those learning outcomes? Then we can sit down and say, do these have a relationship if we compare what Uganda puts in and then the outcomes as reported? Do these two have a relationship? Mm. I would love to, 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 to task you also to go to that extent, if it were possible. Salima, um, you are putting your foot down and saying, do not reduce the current funding by a penny. The voice from the Ministry of Education that is directly in charge of the docket of primary education is telling you, on that we agree. We wouldn't they want the money reduced, but we would actually want it increased Correct. to a bare minimum. One, shouldn't you have interested the Ministry of Education, one, into a lobby before going to court and say, okay, gentlemen at the ministry, you speak the same language as we speak in the civil society. Why didn't you engage them in a lobby instead of going to court? Okay, um, thanks, Peter. First of all, I think before I go directly to your question, you've been asking whether mm. there is a relationship between the funding and the learning outcomes. Mm. But beyond the UESO report, there is another report in which the ministry itself participated. It also came out recently where there was Stromi Foundation, mm. there was UNICEF, there was UNHCR, <coughs> and I don't recall which other actor. Mm. But um, they clearly stated what uh, issues are affecting the education in the country. And the number one issue was poverty. Poverty because people are not able to pay for uh, the funds that they are being uh, asked to contribute towards mm. school development. And where does that come from? Because schools are not well resourced. So once they do not have enough money, they go back to the parents and ask for money in order to be able to run the schools efficiently. So you find that many Salima, I actually thought that the problem right now is the parents have detached themselves completely from the education process. They feel that the government owns these children, the government has taken over, and therefore we cannot contribute in lunch terms, we cannot contribute in uniform, we want to buy books, the government should look after that. We will go and do our drinking, the responsibility has been debunked from us. Okay, um, now that's uh, uh, a huge discussion also regarding, you know, what kind of representation has the mm. government been making. The government has been saying, Bonava so me. So they are saying all the kids are going to go into schools and they have uh, represented themselves as if they are going to provide everything mm. that is going to be uh, required for the kids to be in school. But uh, maybe just to go back to your question, perhaps we could come mm. back to that uh, discussion later. Why didn't we um, engage the ministry? And it would be wrong to say we did not engage the ministry. First Actually, all, my gut is, wouldn't you get better results by doing a lobby mm -hmm. than doing the litigant uh, perspective? Because usually the litigation is a, a line, mm -hmm. yes or no, and then the courts will advise. But lobby is, I get... 50, 100 members of parliament to speak the same voice as I do. Mm -hmm. I know my friend, uh, Honorable Seninde in Wakiso has an education Absolutely. group within, within parliament. I know my... Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, Peter, to Sh answer your question... Wouldn't you lobby and carry the ministry along with to you? To answer your question, this is not a new 
issue. And I think the uh, uh, gentleman from the ministry will agree with me. This is something that civil society and even parliament has been talking about for quite a long time. It is not new that civil society has always been saying UPE is underfunded, UPE schools are doing badly, you need to put in more money. Parliament, right when it was still the social services committee before mm. they divided up education and health, has always been saying the same thing. And for them they've been pushing for 10,000 per pupil per year. Mm. And not per year, per term. Contrary oh, to what the okay. ministry is saying, that would translate the ministry to 30, say it would translate to 30,000 per annum. Per annum. Yeah, so for them they are saying 10,000 per term, the ministry is proposing 10,000 per year, which is still below what parliament has always been saying. So it we are saying, you know, improvement. Yeah, it, it would be an, imp an improvement. So we are saying this is not something new that is coming up. It's been there over the years, but both parliament and the ministry that we've been engaging. What I didn't mention earlier, that as Initiative for Social and Economic Rights, we are also part of the Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group. Mm. So we haven't been doing this work in isolation. That Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group has a group on education that has been engaging both with the ministry officials and with members of parliament. So we felt that, you know, the, there is a limit to how much people can engage in advocacy. But then when the issue was put forward to say that now they are effecting a cut, that is what prompted us to go to, to court. That actually instead of thinking of going forward, they are proposing to cut backwards. And why did we go to court? Because um, of that issue. First of all, we needed to point, it, uh, to point out to government that proposing uh, that cutting that budget would be unlawful government would be violating both its domestic and international obligations really yep mm, <laughs> I, I mean oh, hold on hold on dear. Let that me is understand very this. true let yes. me understand this uh, salima and uh, all of you gentlemen one i budget according to what i am able to collect so it is the resource pass that should determine what i budget for and I'll tell you later wh what the guys at finance have told me. Mm -hmm. But so you cannot crucify me for budgeting for what I have. This is what I have in my kit. No, Peter, you know, and this is where we needed to come and clarify both to government and also to the general public in Uganda that there are, certain, there are implications to everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Now, government under our constitution, they came up with a right to education. True. But also, Uganda is a party to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And in that covenant, there is a right to education. And there has been a lot of clarification around what that right entails. There has to be elements of quality. Right to education all. does not, in effect, mean right to free education, does it? It does. No, when it, it comes to basic uh, primary education, it does mean free education. That is the normative yeah, framework, Peter, and that is... Uganda has committed itself to a number of other international agreements and conventions where it says, yes, we shall get this done, right from the 2000 DACA framework up to today. Yeah. So if Uganda is part of the international community and is subscribing to these agreements it has signed, then it is a clear violation of these agreements, and uh, naturally... What is the violation is here? Because mm -hmm. Uganda has not negated providing free education. Mm -hmm. What it has done, it has said, within my pass, this is what I can provide. No, Peter, that is where I was going um, uh, mm. before uh, his, interje it, yeah. his interjection. But the responsibility under that international covenant is that of progressive realization but there are also rights where government has an immediate obligation. But the general comments that have come from the UN committee that talks about the right to education, there's general comment number 13 on education specifically, but there's also general comment number three that talks about state obligations under the covenant. And it says that once you offer a level of protection, mm -hmm. you're only supposed to go forward. You're not allowed to take deliberate retrogressive measures. And examples that have been given internationally of mm. retrogressive measures are budget cuts.
those are examples of retrogressive measures. So they say you can only take retrogressive measures after extremely careful consideration and you're able to demonstrate that this is the only logical conclusion we can reach based on the available resources within the country. And we feel that that consideration hasn't been made. The Ministry of Finance and some other government officials, I have been told that the problem we have is the core focus is put on the per capita grant that is given to the child. You're not looking at the fact that government employs the teachers and pays their salaries. Therefore, government has already contributed in that angle. That actually currently, and uh, Mr. Mukasa will tell me right or wrong, government is the most facilitated in scholastic materials in terms of books especially to the level that I was told in secondary schools books are kept in stores they are not being used because head teachers are fearing if they are lost we are in trouble but the <laughs> books are there the books are there and they have been provided in excess mm -hmm. to the level I think I was told uh, in m English and math we are doing a book for every four children that is the, the ratio currently and I'm told that is fairly a very good ratio. You will tell me otherwise you are in practice. Um, in addition to that, I was told government has been granting houses for teachers in certain areas. They've been building houses. They build classrooms that schools are no longer required to build classrooms. And all that is funding. And that you, civil society, and the people advocating for education deliberately decide to blind themselves to that. Yeah, Peter, we should not necessarily say government has not done anything. That, that one is very clear. Government has done some part. But we're saying government still has the capacity to do more. You, you were talking about uh, the issue of where should we cut and why shouldn't we cut. Peter, I came without a necktie, but I am dressed. Yes, you are. If instead of not putting on a necktie, I didn't put on the trousers, <laughs> you would obviously see there's something wrong. Okay, I wouldn't let you in the studio. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And this is exactly what you're saying. You're saying, yes, government can leave out the necktie, but it cannot leave out the trousers, the trousers or at least a pair of shorts. And therefore, to say that uh, the, the, the government is giving salary for the teachers, yes. quite good. It has tried, although, of course, I should add that many of the teachers are not getting it. Yet. And it is even becoming another frustration. That one, yes, they have tried. Government is building staff houses. Yes, it has tried in some areas. But it still has a lot to do. To say that the government has given uh, maybe SFG books, has given desks, yes, it has tried. But then there is a gap that is still left. And we are saying government has an obligation to fill this gap. And we are saying, if government was incapacitated, I don't think anybody would harangue to public and say, look, government has done this part and has ignored this even when it has the money. But it would be madness to find me in a necktie and without a trouser and you say I've done a good job. So th that's where the problem comes in. We are saying government is trying. There is this gap of making sure that the children get sufficient capitation grant although it may not be enough. And by the way, in some cases, me, I define my thinking. My thinking is these schools are owned. The owners of the schools are either the churches, mm -hmm. the mosques, and others. Mm -hmm. Government is giving support. That's why most of these schools are said to be government grant aided. Aided. Government mm. aided. Government grant aided. So, government besides failing to put the sufficient grants, should now not forget that it has a duty to mobilize these people to participate in organizing and working on these schools. And this is where the problem has come from majorly because the government is supposed to say, look, you parents, this is your role. You are supposed to provide children with meals. You are supposed to provide children with the books and pencils and pens. You are supposed to look at these children with disabilities and give them support. Now, at the end of the day, we have programs that run. Yes, government gives the grant of, let's say, even if it is 10,000, by the way, which we would want. But there are other issues that must look at, and where we think 
government may have the capacity, but is not looking at it as a priority. Let me take a break. Now, viewers, I'm taking a break. I see a number of messages coming in. Um, one of those is coming from my friend James, uh, no, Ben on Tuinamasiko, who says, even the Uezo report may have question marks. He says, possibly children in Tanzania and Kenya were interviewed in Kiswahili and naturally their literacy in the said language would be better and children in Uganda may have been interviewed in English and you know the deficiencies thereabouts. Then I have uh, someone else that says uh, how come private schools do better than government schools yet most private schools pay worse. Don't go away. We return. I'll break down a bit of uh, monies that are sent to schools and what are they are supposed to do and we'll deal with that with uh, Mr. Tony Mukasa here because I mean the working documents come from them. Don't go away. James Tweheo, uh, Secretary General Yunatu. Uh, James, do you teach? Yes, Used sir. to. I've been teaching. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, Salima from uh, AISA. Uh, AISA is Institute of S Initiative for Social and oh, Economic not Institute. Rights. Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Um, Mr. Lusambo. Yes. yes. Mm. I've been looking at uh, the breakdown in the monies that you allocate to schools, the documentation. And one, I find something very interesting about them. 35% extra instructional or scholastic materials. And you specify books, syllabi, lesson plans, ball pens, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right? The next one, 20% on co-curricular activities. Yes. Music, dance, drama, sports, name them. 15% management, registers, stationery, 10% on administration, including transport. Uh, and 20% may be converted to a contingency expenditure, but most certainly it has to deal with education. Where is the allocation for sanitation? The allocation for sanitation goes into administration. Where, where you mentioned transport. Mm, which is only 10%. Yeah. And uh, to say the least, uh, it is not sanitation that you, be, you, you, you will dig a particular train. Mm -hmm. But that sanitation uh, uh, we were talking about, I'm talking about is to find some soap to provide to clean because does that include the payment for the janitors what do you mean janitors? the cleaners yeah something like that if you are to employ a cleaner but under your pe mm -hmm. you, you, it should be the teachers as i mean the pupils assisted by the teachers to do the cleaning because it is another part of education the digging of the pizza train is done by government. I find that an anomaly. Definitely you would. Because ten percent is little money. Maybe that's what That is that, one. That's because where assuming I had a thousand children, yes. At last year's rate of uh, seven thousand per capita, mm -hmm. it would give me seven million? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Per annum. Correct. And I would spread that by three. Yes. Oh, ten percent of that would be seven hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and then the seven hundred thousand would have to be divided by three yeah. per term, yeah. and that is part of what we are talking about That's as administration. Yes, and it is of that that I expect to provide soap for a thousand children, yes. because for me to have the seven hundred thousand, I need to have a thousand children. Correct. Mm. Right. If I have fewer, I would have you less. Don't have it. Mm. So, I would have to buy soap of that much. I would have to buy tissue. I would have to have emergency sanitary wear for the girls <laughs> of that. Mm -hmm. I would need a spare uniform or two or three for the girls if by accident in the menstrual period they would need a change. Yes. That's an absurdity. It's madness. It's exactly, the least. It's, it's exactly why I said it is insufficient. 
it is just insufficient. The, the more reason one. why they should go to court. The more reason why we we were proposing the ten thousand. But before we but proceed, even in the ten thousand, uh, you, you, you among a thousand children, you'd be talking why about I said ten to million. The least. That would be about three point three million you, a year. Let me tell you the reasons why. Mm. We need to understand a few things. She talked about poverty. Mm. But what I find in our country is that funds are very minimal, especially when we talk about running education in this country. And what I find is that the, the population growth in our country, mm. which is 4.3 and the second highest in the world. And you remember Bill, uh, is it Bill Clinton? Yes. At the education conference recently in a in the Arab Emirates said that Uganda has the biggest family size in the world an average of seven children per family now the population growth considering the economic growth if you were to put the two on a weighing scale you would find that our population growth is a lot higher than our economic growth much as we grow in both, the growth on population is a lot higher. That translates, therefore, that as education, as far as education is concerned, annually, you will require more Pitler twins, you require more teachers, you require more textbooks, you require more classrooms, to mention just a few. Now, Minister of Finance considers this and it says, under all the pressures, we must provide more classrooms under SFG. We must provide more teachers to cater for the growing numbers. And this exactly is, the, is where the problem crops from. Lastly, is to echo Mr. Tweheyo's comment about community and stakeholders mobilization. Mm. That is our take. The, uh, stand, starting with this financial year, the next financial year, Ministry of Education and Sports is going to go out massively into community mobilization. But 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 because but the, hold community, on, Mr. Lusambi, the community have a um, role to play. The community. Yes. In my area, mm. if the community decided as a group that we would like to provide lunch to our children, yes, and we are going to do a standard lunch for the children, right. And we will do posho and beans, we will do maragwe and maize, yes. name, name it. And we are going to do it as a community at school, so it will be a hot lunch. Right. That would imply that we have to collect a certain amount of money standard. Yes. The policy at the Ministry of Education says mm -hmm. they are not. No. Touch this and your fingers are burnt. That's not true. I have the Education Act here. This is why we are going to the, to the community to tell them exactly what the truth is about UPE. Government has never said, don't mobilize yourselves in providing lunch to your children. Sure. No. James. The president says mm -hmm. it. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sorry, yes. Yes. You know, yes. I've been listening. Yes. I'm, I'm listening <coughs> I've been in the field. Mm. At one point <coughs> or another, when the respectable leaders say, look, the education I'm going to give is free. Free means free. Nothing. Mm. Then some of these parents fall back and fold their fingers and say, well, yes, it is free. The other issue is people have been always giving an excuse of private schools. Yes, for them, they seem not to be giving a lot, yet Yes. Three things happen in private schools. Because I was given a figure, interestingly, really? in Butambala, I was quoted a school that pays teachers about 90,000 shillings yes. per month yes. only, mm -hmm. a primary school. Mm. And I was told the neighboring public school mm -hmm. was paying teachers 250. Even if it is 300. Thereabouts. And they were telling me when the grades come at the end of the chain, yes. the private school who pays the PTA eighty ninety thousand 90,000 returns better grades than the public school. And I was to, being asked what behave, is the rationale. You want to behave like the members of parliament who get two, 20 million and claim their salary is 1.5. Mm. That's, that's the way you want to behave. Yeah. Yes, they may be getting 90,000 mm -hmm. as they take home as seen. But they may be getting a lunch, 
They may be getting transport refund. They may be getting other incentives that you don't see. And let me tell you, incentives, all of them should not even be monetized. That's the issue number one. The other issue is the inputs required to do the job. If I have a prep book, if I have a, a place to sit and mark, if I have... They have been provided in the breakdown here. When did, it, when, when, when did you receive that computation grant and when does it come? Mention all those. So if I have the number of children also, and if we are three teachers to attend to a class, it doesn't matter whether we're getting 90 or 30 or even nothing. We get the work done. And this is where people go wrong. And by the way, I don't want people to have a misconception that all private schools are doing well. There are some it. which are terrible. Mm. There are some terrible. which are terrible, yes. So go to these private schools, you'll find children wearing shoes. You'll find children having breakfast. Of course you're talking about tea. the urban private schools. No, no, no. School. That, I was using the rural schools. private that's school. That's rural private schools. You'll find the children where every child, the, the children having pencils, pens, and even a bag in which they have those items. And this is where things get difficult and we can't even compare the incomparable. So, I don't want anybody to bring that as an excuse. I can assure you, these schools where we teach, if we had the inputs, forget about the salary, because salary is something additional. If we had the inputs required to do the job, if we had the motivation and recognition to do the job... And you're saying that the capitation grant actually comes when the term is closed? We are going to open on 19th. Mm. And by the way, it was also erratic because the middle of the term, of the, of the month, and I know many parents who even to take these children to the private schools you're talking about, may find it challenging to raise the money to take them. But forget about that. The problem that comes in is this money is going to come. We have the co-curricular activities. A head teacher will have children participating in the music, dance, and drama. Tony knows that and he likes it. Mm -hmm. The head teacher would be praying that these children don't pass to another level because if they do, <laughs> because yeah, if they do, you will not have the money to take them on. Sure. The next time it will be because let me football, see. Co curricular uh, is supposed to be provided 20%. 20% of yes. uh, 7 of million would be about 1.4. Good. That involves football. You buy the balls, game. you buy the uniform, you buy. After that, they pass and participate very well. And then when they pass very well, then you take them to the sub-county or even the district. So was telling me a set of drums and is at 600,000. And, and for a school of a thousand children, you would that. need at least four you see, sets. They, they have, you know, all those things are not seen. I'll put you there. But that is over and above what else you are supposed to do. And I think this is where we go wrong. We must consider education and learning and learning outcomes, not only what the teacher does when he's in class. No. Because it involves preparation. If you don't have where to prepare from, it becomes a challenge. It, it comes in now to delivery of the material you have prepared. And you may deliver and children have But I am told that the public schools have more textbooks than ever before. Yes, they may appear to be having more textbooks. But do the children have even the pencils and books for to record? I'll pause you uh, and do the children uh, have the meal come to required? Salima a bit. <laughs> one more thing. Salima, I want to go back to the issue of sanitation. I know that your organization did a research on sanitation in certain sections of Uganda. And I find this very interesting. It's a shame that I'm actually asking uh, a lady about this, but girls drop out more than boys. Yes. The, the, there is a figure that I need uh, Mr. Lusambo to justify to me. For about 10 or 8 years, we've been recruiting up to a million children annually. Two million. Into, we started with about a million mm. into primary education. Yeah. The exit point, we have not hit 600,000 as yet. I think the highest was this past year with 500-something thousand, mm, 540,000. How is that explained? Is that associated with the issue of sanitation? Do they actually drop out because of sanitation and other issues? Or is it that the head teachers that uh, Mr. Lusambu Mkasa is supervising actually are filing in ghosts? <laughs> um, there are a number of factors why the girl children drop out. But sanitation is definitely one of the key factors that uh, lead to uh, dropouts by the girls. When we did that research, we trailed the inspector of schools in Mukono. And she was going around inspecting the schools, looking at the sanitation. She was facilities. actually. She.
Mm. She yeah. was going around. That is what yes. I'm... Okay, that's a good one. She was going around inspecting mm. the schools. But what you would find is that um, some schools did not have toilets. No. Other schools had filled up latrines and the maggots were moving <coughs> all over in the toilets. So kids were fearing to enter into the toilets. In some schools, there is no division between uh, where the girls should go and where the boys should go. And then the other issue, we talked to the girls themselves and they kept saying, you know, sometimes when you come, there is nowhere, uh, because many toilets did not have doors, they would not lock. So you are supposed to get into the toilet, there are other kids uh, peeping and they would want to get into the toilet also. So You don't seem to speak of a Uganda of today. Many times when and uh, that is they're Mokono. in their periods, that, that is, is in Mokono. Mokono. Yeah. when they're in their periods, on the precincts of Kampala, they would remain at home and do not come to school. Because even we talked to the senior women uh, teachers, and they also said we do not have like sanitary pads for, for, for the girls. And then the dirty toilets were also causing the girls to have candida in the schools. We talked to doctors and they said it is very harmful for the girl child because they are using dirty toilets and they are getting candida in primary school, you know. It was a very bad thing. So many of the girls were saying, you know, sometimes you're better off remaining at home because you do not have somewhere to go. Or if you soiled your dress, the boys are going to laugh and you mm. have no option but to return home. There is nothing to be helped. But even soap, we talked about soap. Many schools did not have soaps just for washing the hands. So you find that there is a high rate of disease and infection. children keeping out of infection, school yeah. because of infections. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, to say that uh, sanitation is supposed to be covered under administration mm. is an anomaly. We were trying to advocate in that and say, why doesn't the Ministry of Education get together with the Ministry of Health? to be able to come up with a very reasonable uh, intervention before the situation gets out of hand. Because we've also seen the, uh, the school on TV, it was shown one time where even teachers were lining up for one mm -hmm. latrine. Teachers and the kids, and the line had about, you know, a hundred <laughs> children. Okay, yeah, but okay. teachers you also can't in the make line. it any worse but, than but it is. Uh, yes. yeah. you know, the situation is much more grave Hold on. than we see. Viewers, see. you can join the show. We are displaying our numbers on the set. Uh, if you have a question or comment, please put it through. Yes. The situation of sanitation is more grave than you see. You know, she's talking about girls who are able to walk and move in, but we have children with disabilities. Yes. Sure. Uh, and you can imagine a child crawling <laughs> in to a toilet of that nature or to, you know, we have 2.8 million children who are out of school, some of who are children with disabilities. You can see the situation in Northern where they have children with nodding disease. Those ones are even able to walk and stand up, but we even have children who are to crawl. And in most of these schools, you really find there is no there area is no where the children can go. And what do you expect of these children, sincerely? The situation is that grave. But and we must look at it from that perspective. The ministry sometimes mm. puts in the policies. But, but it is not enough to put a policy where the parents or the other stakeholders are not giving it sufficient support to make sure it is implemented to support the livelihood of these children. M Mr. Even what yeah, I, I wanted wanted to chip in and say our construction unit has now been mandated to ensure that construction of pizza twins gives provision for the special needs children. So th th they now have a special room which is specific, uh, specifically constructed to attend to such such special needs children. If he goes, I don't even want to think when of a special child needs child that is sent to a pit latrine because, by its nature, mm. it is absolutely going to be unhygienic, it is going to be challenging in terms of sanitation. You've just told us that we do not have cleaners in this circumstance. We're going to have children that are doing this. But you're talking of t toilets that are filled up. I hate to think about it. But what? Who, who is supposed to watch over this? Who is supposed to do the interventions? Is it a funding problem? Is it a supervision problem? Is it a management uh, disinfunction? Peter, I, would, uh, I, would, I would, Peter, mm. I would like to take this one on a management 
has a management problem. Because I'm, if I am a head teacher, mm. I definitely would not wait for this particular train to fill up. Would you close what the school? Do you do? No. Okay, hold on. I have. We'll take three other callers and then come back. Hello? 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 Yes, you're on. Hello, good evening. Shibazo, this is Louis. Yes, Louis. Now, Shibazo, we should agree on one thing. This entire saga of uh, UPE was, first of all, created to garner public support in 1997. Secondly, this is, my, this is another, I'm, I'm just adding to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. If I told the government was really into this policy, why didn't it, 14 years down the road, look at these things? Because I know it takes a journey of a thousand miles to one step, but really, 14 years and no toilets? Seriously? And they're spending sums and sums of money on other chunkwanzi resolutions? No, it's seriously, no, this is... Okay. I, I get your pain. It's about prioritization. It talks about head teachers having no control over teachers. I partly would love to, to say he has a point, but le then later on, I say, what about the district education office, the, the local government and the district? Because primary education is a decentralized service. Mm. So the, the head teacher is supposed to control these teachers through... Hold on, uh, the caller is holding on the line. Hello? Please uh, monitor the call before you put it through. Yes, go on, Mr. Lusam. So I, I'm, I'm trying to say that the head teacher is supposed to control these teachers through the district education office. Mm. Definitely, if the teacher is errant, the head teacher is supposed to take stock. The head teacher is supposed to counsel this teacher. And after counseling and having sessions recorded, then he goes ahead to report the case to the district education officer. District education officer, in case the teacher is really a problem, this teacher goes to the disciplinary committee, district disciplinary committee. And some of these teachers have been disciplined according to the Education Act. Okay, uh, talk about issues of prioritization because uh, the caller that talks about prioritization was in pain. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, from a public officer's point of view, I'll wave this off you, but from the civil society point of view, in the budgeting process. Uh, the last time I was engaged in anything to do with the education budget, I was told that education actually is one of the biggest recipients of the public funds in this country. So if you're talking about prioritization, education I think is second. No, education. You have Ministry of Works, mm -hmm. then uh, health, then education. education. Yes. Yeah. Um, First of Would you all, do away with roads and uh, move the money to education? No, but on also looking at education in itself, the, the money that is given to education. First of all, it is lumped together. When they are talking about that amount, it includes all sorts of things. The grants that are given to people who are going into higher education, the USE, the money that is at the center, the salaries, all the money is counted as education money. Mm. But the prioritization uh, for us from civil society perspective is first of all, you must get the basics right. And we've always referred to the budget call circular of the mm. Ministry of Finance. Where Ministry of Finance was telling um, line ministries uh, this time round that they should be able to cut back on the consumptive expenditures that they have at the center and be able to put more money into frontline services. And we consider that the money, the capitation grant, is one of those things that shows that you're prioritizing frontline because that is the money that goes to the local governments mm. in order to deliver the education on the ground. So we are saying that there are things that can be cut at the line ministries. It's not only in education. We've Let said it for many of the ministries. J just there very briefly, like very, very briefly, Salima here. Yeah. 
you have a ministry of education that is supposed to monitor, that is supposed to supervise, that is supposed to do capacity building both at the top and down mm -hmm. and uh, do payroll stuff and all the other building things. Mm -hmm. Where would you cut within the ministry that you do not regard as a frontline service? Okay, now there used to be an item that they call general supplies of services some a kind of budget line like that mm -hmm. general supplies that is not cut down nobody knows what goes into general supplies of goods and services well, i have a commissioner here you know? mm -hmm. so he will be able no to tell there. us <laughs> but no um you you find that and it, a lot of money has been going into that budget item if it's no longer there it's that's a there. very commendable thing because that is the place where we've always said as civil society remove that budget item it's unnecessary and ministry of finance has also communicated that so if it's actually been affected it's a good thing but also there are those things when you look at um things to do with buying of stationery things to do with workshops if you did away with one workshop at the center i don't think any learning outcome would be affected. Wouldn't it? You're doing capacity building at the center. It and, depends uh, on what building on that to roll out. It right? depends on what those workshops do, and right especially example. if you, uh, yeah. if if I may, if you look at things like people traveling for international workshops. I've been at meetings where we have people from ministries, and you find that people get there and they don't even attend the sessions they are supposed to attend. And they come back here, they have their per diems, and people are always traveling. So you would rather they didn't travel at all? Let them reduce and let them make people uh, more accountable. Yes, Mr. Mkasa, before travel. I bring in James, uh, mm -hmm. she's talking about prioritization both from the line ministry and the center. Yeah. And she thinks uh, you've been unfair on that. I don't think she's right in that, cut, in that line because we have really done our best. James was trying to make a reference. You remember when, they, when we were trying to raise the teachers' salaries? Mm. And the parliament promised to come and look at our budget and swear to cut. Mm. They failed to allocate where to cut, really. We have, managed, we have <coughs> managed to ensure that all those votes which had somehow redundant or questionable expenditures have been removed from our budget. What we are operating now is on a real minimum. And they are, much as she's talking about workshops, they are workshops which I see very necessary today, yes, but we are not so. even allowed to, to operate them. Mm -hmm. For example, if you were to work on the teacher's attitude today, mm. what would you do, Peter? Wouldn't you really require to gather these teachers and talk to them and hear them talk to you and then have a dialogue? These dialogues to me is the way to go today to bring our people back to cater for education. For example, the communities, the parents, where will you get them to say you people have a role to play? You have a stake in the education of your child. Because today they say, the children are for the government. James, so, uh, yeah, my producer says that uh, we, we should be almost out of here. Yeah. But you've, you've been in the process of trying to see Peter, where do you cut. Peter, this is where the problem comes from. Mm. You know, first of all, we are talking about the goodwill. Mm. And this is what, in some cases... Very briefly, because they are telling me our time Because is even out. when the ministry is called to come in and give explanations and do all that, we have seen them nowhere. We launched a campaign in, in, in Ninja mm -hmm. and we said, Ministry, come, we want to launch a campaign for mobilizing for quality education. The ministry never surfaced. Well, and but uh, Mr. Mukasa is here. Yes, on very short I, wish I, was, I yeah. wish I was invited. <laughs> no, I'm saying to He's saying next today week I'm going to Kweni. When we are talking <laughs> of priorities, <laughs> we are not simply saying the Ministry of Education does not have to run. We are saying, yes. There could be other things that could be left out. But we are also saying that the Ministry of Education is not only the only, the, 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 the only area where government should fund. Well, they could even cut from other areas of government. To to come but to they are telling you that you are number three in our funding line. Yes, we could even have been number one mm -hmm. if that is what it takes. Because there is nothing bigger than human resource. When we are talking of the, the discipline, when we are talking of all these are coming because the education we are offering is not sufficient to make the, the believe that you pull this off.
sure we should unless if education comes up to say we agree with what you're saying I've been and told that the PS and the Ministry of Education the has funding. already sworn an so affidavit that says you're speaking Gujarati. Unless well. if she hasn't looked at the national budget framework paper. Well, gentlemen and lady, it's been a pleasure having you here. I think I still need another show to talk about whether or not improvement in salaries will work for teachers. Mm. Viewers, it's been a pleasure being here this evening talking education. I know it's an emotive issue. Uh, some of the things Salima said really are revolting, annoying.